Hello everyone! Welcome back to a very special video. I'm DTM as always, and for this video, I'll be going over something I've always wanted to show, and that is how to get started in doing Gale Force strategies. Gale Force in AR is just so much fun and very satisfying in my opinion, but it can definitely be intimidating to get into at first. And so I wanted to make this Gale Force guide to hopefully help all of you get started. Especially now that we have Embla in Light and Dark Season, where like player phase strategies reign supreme there. So yeah, hopefully this will be helpful, and if it was, be sure to like, subscribe, hit the bell, all that jazz to help support the channel. It only takes 5 seconds to subscribe, but it truly does help out this channel a lot, and I really do appreciate all the constant support. So yeah, let's get started. The first thing that we should probably go over is, what exactly are Gale Force strategies? What are they all about? Well, Gale Force is a strategy archetype for Aetherate's offense that aims to sweep the enemy defense in one turn. It doesn't have to be on turn 1, can be on turn 2 or 3, etc. But for the most part, the idea is to deal with every single unit on the enemy defense in one go. Now this doesn't mean defeating every unit, as in Aether Raids you do need to get the pots, so generally you try to make it so that you leave one unit remaining in a situation where they cannot attack you. This is most commonly done by quote-unquote trapping ranged units, leaving an armor unit and getting out of range, or more recently with Saether, you can have Saether make the last enemy unit and turn for their perf skill, as long as it is an odd turn of course. Regardless, the enemy unit cannot attack, and on the next turn, you have all your actions remaining to get the pots and finish off that last enemy. Now, it isn't always the case that you have to leave an enemy alive. Sometimes you can get all the pots either before or during the turn you do the Gale Force, but those are fairly rare. Obviously, doing this, sweeping an entire team besides one in just one turn, involves a lot of planning and execution skill, which is why it is very intimidating to start out with. But because you are doing everything in one turn in your player phase, every single thing is under your control. The combat you choose, the place you move, etc. There isn't any room for the enemy to respond, and you don't have to try and predict how the AI will move or whether or not your units can tank the enemy. It's all under your control, which is why I personally love it so much. That's all well and good, but how does one actually take out the enemy defense in one turn, with the limited number of units you have? And how do you get the most of your units to be able to engage the enemy in that turn? Well, there are two main tools. The first is the special that this strategy is named after, Gale Force, and other similar effects. Gale Force allows you to take another action, and essentially allows your units to trade up two for one. Normally, a unit is only able to get one engagement, but with an extra action, you get two, hence two for one. Some units don't even need Gale Force to get extra actions, like uh, Fallen Edelgard or Ninjoran. But yeah, basically, Gale, Gale Force strategies work best when the units you use can proc extra actions. The second tool, in general, is Wings of Mercy. In general, Gale Force strategies will try to get their units at 50% HP or less so that other units can warp in with Wings of Mercy on their B-slot. Technically, there are other methods of warping that don't rely on WOM, like Ascended Florina, but those are so rare that basically all the time you'll be using Wings of Mercy. Now, how do you proc more actions to help you with your Gale Force clear? I think most would agree that if each of your six units on offense only had an action, it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to sweep the enemy defense. How does a unit trade up actions, so to speak, consistently? Well, the special Gale Force has 5 cooldown, so ways to reliably accelerate that special cooldown is paramount. This is why effects like slaying and special acceleration, and really any effect that can help reduce the special cooldown of Gale Force is so valuable. Slaying obviously makes it so that with special acceleration from Heavy Blade, you only need to hit twice to proc Gale Force, assuming no guard or tempo effects. Slaying makes Gale Force into 4, and each hit with acceleration gets it down 2, meaning that after 2 hits, Gale Force will be charged. This is also why tempo is very valuable, since you can ignore those guard effects that might prevent you from proccing Gale Force consistently. A reliable way to double or just having brave hits is also very valuable to ensure that you get those two hits. 
Thus, you generally want to have a unit with high speed and even NFU effects for those two hits, if you don't have Brave. Obviously though, this assumes the enemy doesn't just die in one hit. That means that Gale Force only gets down to two and won't get proc so that is an issue. Units that can proc Gale Force with just one hit is very rare, and generally require outside assistance. In most cases, you would try to get the cooldown count of Gale Force to two, so that with Special Acceleration, it just takes one hit for Gale Force to proc. This can be from Infantry Poles, Asker, Raphael, etc. One of the best units for this actually is Valoria, who can give her support partner minus two cooldown at the start of turn one, as well as herself to act as a follow-up unit. This is why Valoria is like one of the best, if not the best unit you can have for Gale Force. If you can get a unit to be able to proc Gale Force with just one hit, that is what we call quote unquote one tap Gale Force, because they just need one tap. <laughs> There are some that don't need outside assistance, like Navarre or units running its curtains, for example, but in general they do. Otherwise, if they don't have one tap and instead have like two turn Gale Force, they might need to get Dance to get that second tap to then be able to proc Gale Force. Alternatively, they might not need the Gale Force special at all to get an extra action. They might just have a dual skill that grants an extra action, either to themselves or to their allies. That obviously bypasses the need to proc Gale Force and manipulate cooldowns, but obviously has the downside of being unusable when the dual hindrance structure is still active, which can be a huge problem, especially against defenses with a lot of dual units. So if you do have like that dual skill extra action, that is something to keep in mind. But and then in general, this is pretty self-explanatory how to get that extra action, you just press a button. Now, dancers are very common in Gale Force clears, and that might make you think that they help the clear by having extra actions. But that isn't really true. And to understand why, we need to discuss the concept of trading up in terms like two for one. Now, normally, a unit has one action and can take out one unit with that action. However, by using Gale Force or another way to get an extra action, a unit can have two actions and can take out two units Thus, we have two combats per one unit, or two for one. Some units have three actions, like Summer Edelgard, and those are three for one units. This is pretty simple so far, right? But what about dancers? Well, if dancing is all they are doing, then they just dance a unit, and that unit takes out an enemy. So in effect, that dancer is only able to take out one enemy for that dance. They're not two for one, but one for one. They don't trade up more actions, Rather, they transfer their one action to another unit through the dance, who can then take out an enemy. But that doesn't increase the amount of enemies you can take out if you would have just used a dancer, that dancer for combat, for example, or any other one-for-one -one unit. Obviously, dancing gives you a lot of flexibility in the choice of unit to have that transferred action, but it doesn't increase the net actions you have. Now, there are dancers that are two-for-one like Gale Force Dancers, or Dual or Harmonic Dancers with a dual skill, like Brave Marianne, Legendary Ninian, but those obviously are a lot different than your standard dancers, like Mythic Plumeria, who are one for one. All right, moving on, how does one actually do a Gale Force clear? Well, Gale Force as a strategy is very flexible, both in the units you can use in the team and the way you execute the strategy. There are so many options, and it can be hard to give an overview to all the possible ways to do Gale Force. But I'm going to try, and I will say in general, it goes like this. You get a unit to go in and eventually get into Wings of Mercy range. From there, other units warp in, either taking on other enemy units or dancing, etc. That is like the absolute high level outline of Gale Force, and we can see that it has two main phases. The first being the initiation phase, having that first unit go in and eventually get into WAM range. The second phase is the follow-up phase, having other units warp in to finish the job. At a very basic level, pretty much all Gale Force clears will consist of those two phases. So let us begin with the initiation phase. What is it all about? Well, to go more in depth, 
This is the stage where we have an initiator engage on the enemy defense, in a way where that initiator acts as a Wings of Mercy beacon for other units to follow up. Ideally, when the initiator gets into WAM range, they should be in a position that best facilitates this follow-up, and preferably have also taken out some of the enemy units, though technically, that is required. We will get into that. The more pressing concern when initiating is how to get into WAM range in the first place. For this, there are three main options. The first is through Winter Bernadetta and other similar effects. Winter Bernadetta can damage your own units and herself without needing to engage in combat, which, in conjunction with assists like Reciprocal Aid or Ardent Sacrifice, allows you to get a unit into WAM range just by themselves without any enemy interference. Pretty much any unit in this case can act as an initiator with Winter Bernadetta, and is pretty straightforward. There's not a lot to discuss about it. That being said, this obviously works with only Winter Bernadetta, and I guess Brave Lysithia to a certain extent, and you have to use them in place of a potentially other unit that could Gale Force, Dance, etc. So it is not exactly that common. The second way to get into WAM range is to have your initiator naturally get into WAM range due to combat. Obviously, when trying to engage onto the enemy defense, sometimes they counterattack, and the idea is to get into WAM range with those counterattacks. Now obviously, getting into WAM range this way is a lot less consistent and requires a lot of calculations beforehand to ensure that it will actually work with the team you are using. There are a lot of cases where it might not just work. Maybe the counterattack damage isn't enough, or maybe when the enemy can't attack, or maybe the enemy just gets one-shotted, or takes out your initiator. This is why I personally never rely on just combat damage to get into WAM range. I don't like the inconsistency. However, because of the way ARD is structured, there are often very common units that are present and which you can rely on to get your initiators into WAM range. Units like Saros or more recently Medius are pretty common, and when one appears that you have prepared your initiator for, it is more reliable that way. Another way to increase consistency is miracle effects like Brave Celeb. You can use that to take on many powerful melee units without fear of dying, and using that power to safely get Brave Celeb into WAM range. The third is to use Fury, or other after combat damage to get into WAM range. This is probably the most popular method and the most reliable outside of Winter Bernadetta, with the advantage that you don't have to have Winter Bernadetta take up a unit slot. Especially now with the Fury Steel, so many units can be made to reliably get into WAM range without any other damage from external sources. Beforehand, very few units were actually able to consistently get into WAM range from just Fury, which is why Air was very popular as a Gale Force initiator as part of Air Force. Now, with Double Fury, pretty much any unit can be made to get into WAM range. When doing initiation with Fury, you generally can only rely on getting two combats to get into range. For an initiator to get that second action, they either proc it themselves through like the Gale Force special, or rely on a dancer that is either near enough or can be positioned to dance the initiator to get that second combat. Initiators with Kanto in particular are very good here, as if they aren't able to proc Gale Force on the first combat, they can Kanto back into a dancer's range to get dance and then get that second combat. Theoretically, this can lead to a third combat if they are then able to proc Gale Force, but in general, you should assume that two combats are all you get to rely on with Fury. A very small number of initiators can reliably have three actions to get into WAM range, and by small, I mean the Edelguards, but other than her, you really only get two combats to get into WAM range consistently with Fury. Now, to be clear, these are not mutually exclusive. You can combine them in any method you want. For instance, I use Summer Edelguard with Fury on non-Chaos Seasons. And on those non-Chaos Seasons, I have to run Winter Bernie, because the extra HP from the Mythics means that without her, I actually don't fall into WAM range after three combats with just Fury 4. Sometimes with Summer Edelguard though, I don't bother with that if I see a Medius, and I know that if I engage on him with Summer Edelguard, she will naturally fall into WAM range with the combat damage. So with that, I don't 
actually use Art of Sacrifice to lower Summer Edelgard's HP down more. Okay, so now that we've figured out how to get into WOM range, how do we actually engage on the enemy? Well, that really depends on your initiator unit and the enemy's threat range, but there are some common patterns to this engagement. The first is the simplest, and it is when your initiator outranges your opponent. In this scenario, you don't need any outside assistance as you can just go in and attack. Pretty straightforward, this generally occurs if you are using, say, a cavalry unit or a ranged infantry or flyer, or if you are facing a Catria ball that isn't that well set up. It's pretty straightforward, not a lot to talk about. The more interesting scenarios are when you need assistance to get in range to engage the enemy. Generally, in those instances, you would either smite or reposition your initiator into range, depending on the map layout and such. Obviously, when doing so, you should try to use units that have the least amount of actions and would otherwise contribute the least to the clear. Sometimes the map is such that you need to have two assists, like double smite, or repo then smite, or double repo. Um, this is sometimes required when your initiator doesn't have that much range, and or the, the enemy defense has an absolutely huge threat range. And this might also happen because the initiation is somewhat blocked by a trap that you need to smite the initiator onto to work around that. A similar way to do that is to have an initiator go into a position, then get danced, and then get smited. And this is generally done in similar scenarios, and also if there is limited space or there are hex traps that might cause issues with the first smite, or just to clear out penalties. Obviously, using a dancer this way is making that dancer and its flexibility unavailable for the follow-up. So doing that is generally not advised if there are other options. Speaking of dancers, as I mentioned before, sometimes your initiator will need the help of a dancer to get that second combat to fall into WOM range. If the dancer is positioned close enough, that dancer could potentially just be in range and could just move and dance. But what if you can't position a dancer close enough? There are many maps where it would be impossible to do so. There are two main ways to have the dancer in range of the initiator. The first option is if the initiator has Kanto and can Kanto back into the dancer's range. This requires the initiator to have Kanto, but has the benefit of not requiring an action to get the dancer into range. This does mean you don't have Kanto to position your initiator after the initiation phase to get into a better position, but for melee, you weren't going to be able to do that anyways if you didn't proc Gale Force before that. So yeah, um, that is pretty great. Uh, the second way is using the positional assist, or using any positional assist, to get the dancer in range. Most often smite, sometimes repo, just like the initiator. You just smite the dancer up, and hopefully they are in range to then go and dance that initiator. This is pretty straightforward to understand, but obviously requires you to spend an action on that positional assist. Traps are something to look out for when doing initiation as well. If they are in close quarters with the enemy unit, uh, it can make positioning very hard, so care needs to be taken that there is enough space to maneuver around those traps. If they block initiation, generally you have to smite your initiator onto them, unless they are a hex trap, which is obviously a must avoid if you don't meet the HP thresholds. If you need a dancer to get a second combat, making sure that you can dance without gambling a trap is also important. Disarm trap can help with initiating, or if possible, you can test those traps on the turns before you engage, but it is very tricky uh, to set up properly. Something to also keep in mind is to make sure that any structures that are blocking your initiation is taken out. If you are running safe defense, obviously you have a turn to clear any obstructions and to position yourself for engagement on the next turn. If you are running Bolt Tower, you have two turns, assuming you can stay out of the enemy threat range. Most obstructions will be straightforward to deal with, but if, say, you want to clear out a structure next to the enemy to have that engagement spot, it is advisable to make sure you have the mobility for that, either with Kanto, assist skills, dancers, etc., to ensure your units can retreat out of the enemy range. 
That is something you would need to plan out when doing your clear. Now, at the end of the initiation phase, when you have gotten your initiator into warm range, the end position is extremely important. Ideally, you want your initiator to be in a position where their adjacent spaces are next to other enemy units, preferably multiple. That way, your initiator can stay in place and multiple follow-up units can warp in and engage on the enemy. It isn't required, as we'll see in the follow-up section, but it would be ideal. This is where units with Kanto shine, as if you are able to save your Kanto until the end of the initiation phase, you can use that Kanto at the end to position to a better spot. Now for melee units, this requires procking an extra action immediately after the first engagement, as otherwise Kanto will be procked then as melee units will always be able to have one movement Kanto at minimum, even when using near trace thanks to the remaining plus one. Now ranged units with far trace is where things get interesting, and by that I mean Njorin. If on the first engagement you are able to expend all of your movement, then there is no movement left for far trace due to the lack of the plus one, so you don't actually proc Kanto. If then you dance and move one space to have that second combat, because you haven't yet proc'd Kanto, Kanto would now proc at the end of the second engagement with two movements, which you can then use to position yourself. This is something that often gets overlooked, but is a huge optimization you can do during your initiation. If you are able to use Ninjorin and are using Ninjorin and don't need to Kanto back to get into dance range, then you should try to expend all your movement on that initial engagement to be able to have Kanto after the second one to position better. So, from all of that, we can see that though theoretically any unit can be an initiator, there are some characteristics that we would like to see. The first is a reliable way to get an extra action. Even if they don't proc that extra action during the initiation, Eventually, during the follow-up, it would be preferable for our initiator to have that extra action just to provide more actions and more flexibility. This can come from Gale Force and the ability to proc it reliably. We already talked about this before, so I won't go over it again. But being reliably able to get another action is very crucial. Alternatively, they might have a dual skill that grants them an extra action. For that, it is most often the case that you can't actually proc that dual skill when initiating due to the dual hindrance structure. But as mentioned, during the follow-up, if either all of the duels are taken out or the structure itself is taken out, having that extra action is extremely powerful for the execution of the strategy. The second is a reliable way to engage onto the enemy defense, or just good movement options. Sure, you could smite an initiator in, but it would be great if you didn't have to. Obviously, there are some maps where you just can't without assistance, but an initiator ideally makes that as easy as possible, whether that is due to their range or them having disarmed trap to be able to ignore traps. Having Kanto also really helps, whether it is to get danced more easily during initiating or positioning after getting into warm range to get into a better spot. That is obviously very, um, very ideal for the end turn positioning of the initiation phase. The third is obviously good combat. You want to take out the enemy units when you engage onto them, as that leaves less things to deal with during the follow-up phase. So yeah, pretty self-explanatory there. While I don't want this to be a unit recommendation video, there are certainly standout initiators that work really well. On the ranged unit side, this is basically confined to Linja and Ninjorin, both of which are duos with extra actions, have brave effects to help with combat, and have good movement flexibility, Linja being able to run Disarm Trap and Enjorin having cap range. On the melee side, we have Brave Seleph for the range, Miracle, Slaying for the Gale Force, etc., and Summer Edelgard for the triple action, Brave, etc. There are plenty others, but those I would say are the standout ones. Now that we've gotten our initiator into WAM range, it's time to start using other units. The follow-up phase of Gale Force aims to use the remaining actions on our team to take out the rest of the enemy defense, except for one. As mentioned, generally one enemy unit is trapped or incapacitated, so that on the following turn, we can get the pots. Executing the follow-up can generally require a lot of planning or improv, 
and it's hard to give general instructions on how to do it with the variety of defenses, units, etc. But there are some tips and patterns that can definitely be employed during the follow up phase. The first and easiest pattern to follow up is to just use a dancer to dance either the initiator or if there was a previous follow up unit that is positioned correctly to dance that follow up unit. Now keep in mind that if all the unit is doing is a single dance, then you aren't trading up actions as mentioned before. So ideally that dancer can also either take out a unit before dancing, proc gale force, then dance, or have a dual harmonic skill to have a second dance, or be brave Marianne and do combat and dancing at the same time, or are a mythic dancer, because you need mythics anyways. Generally when dancing, you want to dance at a space that is the least intrusive and more out of the way to leave room for your units to combat the enemy. This is sometimes difficult, especially if you are dancing a follow-up unit or the initiator is next to traps. So in those cases, dancing might not be the best move and other options might be better. One thing to note is that when dancing the initiator, you have the advantage of moving where the follow-up units can warp to, as generally, the initiator is the only unit that can consistently be relied on to be in one range, dancing the initiator to then go out, take another unit while positioning to a new place with more follow-up opportunities can enable a lot of options. So that is something to keep in mind. If you are using, say, dual peony for a two-for-one dancer, it is important to pay attention to positioning and future follow-ups to make sure that peony or any dual harmonic unit is in range of another unit to activate their dual skill. A common pattern is having that dance unit move one space to deal with another enemy unit, then warping in another dancer, which will be next to peony, and thus can get danced later. Another pattern with this is having the follow-up unit remain in place when dealing with an enemy unit still next to them, and then doing the duo. Obviously with harmonic dances with two range, it is a lot more lenient, and also these dual and harmonic dances can only be used after the dual hindrance deactivates, most commonly through taking out all of the dual harmonic units. So when using these types of dancers, you have to be sure that by the time you want to use the dual or harmonic dance, you have already deactivated the dual hindrance. So be sure to plan for that. The second pattern that is common in follow-up involves allowing multiple follow-up units to warp in from the same WAM beacon to combat the enemy units. This requires the first follow-up unit to maneuver in a way that leaves space and enemy units for the next follow-up unit to engage on. In general, what happens in this pattern is that the initiator is positioned such that two enemy units are in reach with WAM. The first unit warps in takes out a unit, then moves one space to take out a different unit, leaving the remaining enemy unit in reach for the next follow-up unit, and having that space free for the second follow-up unit to warp in. This is why positioning of the initiator unit is very important. The third pattern is sort of a combination of the previous two. Here, after your initiator gets into WAM range, you have one follow-up unit, warps in, takes out a unit, proc gale force. Now with the follow-up unit in place, you can then warp in a dancer to dance the initiator who can then go on and take out another unit and reposition where they are. This doesn't require the initial initiator position to have their adjacent spaces next to at least two enemy units and doesn't need more than one follow-up unit, so it is a more flexible pattern. Once again though, it is important to not uh, just rely on that as just dancing does not trade up, so only use this pattern if necessary. The fourth pattern that is common in follow-up is using positional assist to move your own units out of the way or into range. This is especially common for finalizing the trap, which we'll go more in depth later, but suffice it to say, sometimes you want a, to shove a unit out of range or smite them into a blocking position, or just moving your wand beacon to a better spot or moving a unit in range of a dual or harmonic dance. There are a lot of scenarios where using positional assist can be very beneficial to your clear in the follow-up. Generally, this happens after a unit exhausts all of their available actions, as there's no way to use that unit again after the assist unless they get danced. 
there are a bunch of other potential patterns that often appear and are employed during the follow-up, but at a high level, these are the main ones that can work in general. A lot of the skill in the follow-up phase, therefore, comes from deciding which patterns or combinations of patterns to employ and how to execute the specifics. Patterns like these aren't detailed instructions, so rather you should think of them as conceptual frameworks to base how you execute the follow-up. As mentioned, the follow-up phase is hard to give specific and detailed advice, but in general, patterns like these can help serve as a place to start thinking about the execution. Now, an important part of the follow-up phase that I think deserves its own section is on how to trap units, or alternatives you employ. This is a big part of the initial difficulty of Guild Force, and is obviously very important to the strategy's overall success. You do need to get those pots, after all. There are three main ways to do this, of which one is by far the most popular. The first is simply leaving a unit alive and getting out of their range. Most often, the enemy unit left is either a melee infantry flyer or an armor unit. To do this often requires either Kanto or positional assist to get your own units out of their range, after which in general there is one turn to get the pots and finish off the remaining enemy unit. It's pretty simple to understand, but not really used due to the awkwardness of trying to get units out of range. There is the alternative of having a melee enemy engage on your ranged unit, or vice versa, but that is also not that common as it's always dangerous to allow the enemy to attack you. It either has to be like a dancer or done as a last resort. The second and most recent method is using Sather. Sather can make the enemy unit end turn as long as she meets the res check. Very powerful, but also pretty straightforward. You just warp her in, maybe attack another enemy unit, and have her in the cardinal directions of the enemy unit you want to leave alive. Not much to say about that, it's uh, pretty straightforward, obviously only can be done in Astra and Chaos Seasons, but very very helpful indeed. The third and definitely most common is to trap a ranged unit, or multiple ranged units. Ranged units cannot attack those that are adjacent to it, so if you surround that ranged unit with your own, and with help from either the map layout or the structures, it makes it so that the enemy unit cannot attack and thus can't do anything as we go to the next turn. So when executing a Gale Force strategy, you should plan in advance which unit or units you are going to try to trap. There are common patterns of trapping units, Sometimes there will be a ranged unit in a crook surrounded by three sides with structures or whatnot, which makes it very easy to trap that unit. More often, sometimes there will be a ranged unit in a corner that you need to trap with two of your own units. On rare and more difficult occasions, it might be necessary to only do it on an enemy unit with only one side blocked already. And something to keep in mind is that you don't have to trap only one unit. Sometimes the defense layout is conducive to trapping multiple units. One example is here, where we have two ranged units in a diagonal, one in a crook, one in a corner. With only two units, the same amount as trapping one unit in a corner, you can trap both. Trapping multiple units, when possible, is extremely good as it reduces the amount of enemy units you need to take out, freeing up actions. Another example is here, where we have three units, one melee in a corner and two ranged adjacent to it. Because the melee unit is blocked by the ranged units from attacking and can't move, and the ranged units are blocked by that melee unit, you can effectively trap all three of them with just three, maybe even just two of your own units, like in our example. You can see here how despite what the danger range says, the enemy isn't actually able to attack us. Theoretically, this can continue on to be able to be even trap even more units, but obviously that is very very rare. Still, it is important to be able to recognize situations where you can trap units and how you can do it. There's this example of trapping two, one melee in a crook and one range being surrounded. This trapping two, both range in a sort of upside down V trap, etc. There's so much, but hopefully this gives you an idea of what to look out for when planning your Gale Force clears. Who knows, you might get the rare 5 unit trap, which yes, I did actually encounter during my Aether Rage runs. Pause the video if you want to work out for yourself how everyone is trapped here. Now, as for the units you would employ in a follow-up capacity, 
I'd say there are a lot more options for this than others, mainly due to the fact that you don't need to get them into WAM range for them to be effective. It's a lot less restrictive. The characteristics we would like to see in our follow-up units are as follows. First, they must be able to reliably get an extra action, preferably not from dual or harmonic skills, since having an extra action allows you to make more space for more follow-up units, being able to consistently and immediately proc Gale Force or get some other action is paramount. This is not as important for dual or harmonic dancers, but for Gale Force dancers, it is obviously very important since they need to get that extra action to then dance to trade up. This is why one tap Gale Force units shine here. The second characteristic is mobility. Having the flexibility to reach the enemy units you want can make a difference in a Gale Force clear. Even after combat movement, like Lunge or Kanto, is extremely powerful to be able to move into a position to help trap a unit, for example. Reagan, in this case, is a prime example of Kanto's power in Gale Force. Even though I don't run Gale Force on her, so she only has one action, her ability to trap units with that Kanto provides so much utility to the clear. The third, of course, is good combat as always. This is less important because theoretically you could use like Savage Blow and the like to help chip down the rest of the enemy units, but it is still important nevertheless. Now something to mention is that many of the most powerful follow-up units actually also provide supportive capabilities to the Gale Force clear. The most noticeable is Valoria, who, as mentioned before, gives special cooldown count minus two to her support partner, which is very valuable to make basically any unit become one tap. This is still something unique to her and is extremely powerful, and she can get one tap Gale Force herself with her beast tempo, allowing her to be a top tier follow up unit in general. Another is Asker, who can Gale Force and grant special cooldown charge minus one as well to the allies. Supportive effects can be anything, like giving NFU, guaranteed follow-up, Kanto, more movement, warping, pathfinder, the list goes on. But I think in my opinion, those that can accelerate or lower the cooldown count is most impactful due to the necessity of units being able to get that extra action. Like with the initiators, I don't want to delve too deep into unit recommendations for follow-up units, but there are some units that I do think are worth mentioning. The first is Valoria, for reasons I've already explained. The second is actually Fallen Edelgard, who is basically the only unit that has three actions and can warp in with Wings of Mercy. Instead of running Armored Wall, you run Wings of Mercy and get the special acceleration with the Heavy Blade Seal. This is very powerful, and if you follow my channel, you already have seen plenty of examples of that in action. The third is actually more F2P, but Navar, Grail Unit Navar, is very good for his weapon effect granting special cooldown count minus two. Combine that with Times Pulse and Flashing Blade, and you have a one tap Gale Force follow up unit. And he's free. He's actually really good at follow up and is very underrated, in my opinion. Soleil, another F2P option, I also think is very underrated due to her Fire Sweep effect and coming in with special acceleration already. All she needs is Quicken Pulse or cooldown support from like Asker, and she works very well as two tap Gale Force, sir, with amazing combat thanks to her Fire Sweep effect. One tap with Valoria. On the more dancer side, any dual or harmonic dancer works really well, as long as you meet the title requirements like Harmonic Azura, Dual Peony. Of course, Brave Marianne is also really good as a two for one dancer that doesn't get affected by the dual hindered structure, which just grants so much flexibility and power. And of course, in Wind Season, Legendary Ninian being able to dance and then take an action is also a very powerful two for one trade up. I could go on because, like I said, there are so many units that can work in a follow up capacity that it would take forever. So check out any recent tier list of Gale Force units to get a good general idea, like Oblivion's or Joel's. The links to those will be in the description. When making a Gale Force team, generally you employ one initiator and have the rest of the team be follow-up units in some capacity. Obviously, if your initiator might rely on a dance to get into WAM range, then a dancer is definitely needed, preferably a two-for-one or a mythic dancer. There is a lot of variety when it comes to team comps, so like before, it is hard to give general advice, but there are some things to keep in mind. 
First, if you are using a harmonic dancer, then making sure you have a unit, preferably an initiator, in the same title is important to actually be able to use that harmonic skill. Also, if units you are using need special cooldown help, then obviously be sure to include those units that help reduce the cooldown like Asker or Infantry Pulse and the like. Just making sure that you have your bases covered when it comes to getting extra actions is key. At the end of the day, you want as many actions as possible on your team, as that gives your Gale Force execution a lot more power and a lot more flexibility. Now one thing to keep in mind is that in non-Chaos AR seasons, you need to include the Mythic units. This can be painful because most players, including me, don't really have a choice of which Mythics they have to use. It is generally dictated by which Mythics score the most, i.e. the ones with the most merges, with no thought on how well they do in Gale Force strategies. There are some Mythics that actually do really well, like Reagan thanks to Kanto, Thor obviously, Sather, Asker, Ash, Dagger, the Dancers of course, but then there are those that don't. Unfortunately for those that don't do well in Gale Force, it is very typical that you just use them as Smite bots or Repo bots. And some can't run Smite, like Elemi, the actual worst ever mythic for Gale Force. She is so bad at Gale Force, never again. It is still worth running Wings of Mercy on them in case you need like that one extra action or to help trap a unit, but yeah, in most cases you'll probably have to try and work around them. This is also true for the bonus unit as well if they are not included in your mythics. Some bonus units obviously can work really well in Gale Force, but others, they'll just be smite bots. Having the right team and units and whatnot is definitely important, but it is also important that the strategy is executed well. And this is generally where the intimidation comes from. So how do you, you execute a strategy? Well, I already broke it down earlier in the initiation phase and the all follow-up phase and offered general guidelines and patterns, but obviously that is not specific to a particular defense you might come across. I will say one thing that can definitely be helpful when starting out is to basically take a screenshot of the defense and plan out in writing what you are going to do. That way, any potential mistakes in spacing, position, etc. can be caught beforehand and you can make adjustments. This way, you could also calculate every engagement if you really wanted to, to make sure you are able to take out the enemy and meet the stat checks, but that is generally overkill though. Obviously, if you are really struggling, that could work as well. If drawing on a screenshot is awkward, you can do it on paper as well. I'm going to give an example here. For this demonstration, I will be using my Thor Force team. As of recording, it is Astra Season and Sather is the bonus, so we're using Sather as our bonus unit. I would anyways because Sather is amazing. And yeah, as we can see, Thor here will be our initiator. Um, she doesn't need Fury 4 in order to get into Wamri. She attacks, defense, push, 4. Works fine with the 5 damage. And with 2 combats, that does 22 damage total, so she will be in wand range after two combats. Hopefully by proc and gale force, if not, we can always just have Plumeria dance. And yeah, the idea is Thor will go in either by herself or with Smite, get the first hit, uh, hopefully proc gale force, if not, get danced by Plumeria, and then take out another one. She'll be in wand range, and then everyone else can follow up. So yeah, as we can see, Thor is our one initiator, all the rest of the team will be follow-up. And yeah, let's see this math. Alright, so we have our uh, screenshot of the map we need to take out. And immediately, I see that both of these here have traps. Um, if we can take out this structure, this catapult, then we can use Thor to engage without having to worry about the trap. Um, this catapult is also targeting our Bolt Tower, so if we can take out this Catapult turn 1, then obviously we get the Bolt Tower to go off on both of these three units, which, since two of them are save, that would be really helpful for our clear. So let's start by seeing if we can take out this Catapult on turn 1. Um, let's see, the only way we can reach that turn 1, just with a unit, would be Sather, since Sather... if Sather was here, then 
see if I can move up three and take out this catapult. Now, we do need to make sure we repo Sather out, because if, say, Sather is here, then Krom can move here and attack Sather. And in fact, if we take out if we take out this catapult, then Krom's range will actually be like this. So we do need to make care be careful of that extended range. So yeah. Um, if we can have Thor here and Plumeria here, and maybe smite in Thor, then we can probably get that to engage with this expanded range. So let's work on that assumption for now. So if we have, say, Sather here, um, Sather on turn one, if this obstruction is cleared, can take out the catapult. Now, we only have two other ranged units, Marianne and Plumeria, that could take out this structure. Um, we probably want to use Marianne because a dancer might be useful later on. So let's say um, Marianne should be here. And on turn one, we take out this structure with Marianne, and then Sather can go in and attack this catapult. Um, we do need to make sure we repo out. And thankfully, we do have Reagan. This is Astro Season. So if Reagan, say, is here, we can go here, repo Reagan out, re uh, repo Sather out, and then Kanto. Um, let's see here. Uh, Volk does have Kanto control. Anyone else have Kanto control? No, so Volk does have Kanto control. Um, but even still, like, Reagan can still Kanto 1 with Kanto control. As we can see, uh, if the target's range is one, target can move one space. So if, say, Reagan's here gets Kanto controlled, we can still move one over here, which will take us out of Krom's range. So that's good. Let, actually, let me see. Are we in range? One, two, three, four. Oh, we're not even in range of Kanto control. So never mind. We're, we're, we should be fine here. Um, Let's see here. Uh, what else should we do? I mean, we want Thor and Plumeria as close to these positions as possible, because again, we do eventually want to smite them in and get them to engage. So let's say if we can have Thor here, uh, we somehow clear this, still don't know how. On the next turn, we can move Thor up one, or we could just move one Thor here. And yeah, we, we want Plumeria and Thor as close as possible to the, these positions, so Plumeria will probably be here then, which means that Edelgard has to be here. Now, this is tricky because Arvel does have guard. So we want to make sure that we're out of like out of these two columns and have like Edelgard here at the start of turn three when this bolt tower like goes off. I'm go since you know we're taking this catapult, we might as well wait for the bolt tower, so. By turn three, we need to like have Edelgard here so we can start attacking before the healing tower kicks in. Okay. I th okay, I think we have a general idea of how we want to do this. Let's see if this actually works. Um, let's see here. Okay, so Marianne first takes out this obstruction. Very nice. Sather will move up here and then attack this structure, right? Just have an arrow. I guess. Okay. Sather will need to get repo out of range, so Reagan will go here, re will go here, repo Sather out, and then I guess go wherever because we're outside of Kanto control range. So Sather will be here now. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, what we can do is have Plumeria go over here. One, that moves Plumeria closer to our position, so on the next turn we just need to move up one. And also we can dance Sather. That could be helpful. And then Sather could, like, go in and get out this structure, too. So that we can move Thor close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think, I think we're getting this. Okay, so we have Plumeria go here. Dance up Sather. Right? And then Sather will, I guess, go here and take out this structure so that Thor can go here. Okay. Does that all work? 
I think it does. So, yeah, Sather moves up here. Reagan repos back. Canto's over. Plumeria goes over here. This spot is free, so Sather can stance. Sather can take out this, I guess. And then Thor can go here. And because Plumeria moved, that also means that Edelgard also can move here. So that on turn... On turn... Uh, on the next turn, we can move one space over again and get out of Arvel's range. Okay. Alright, cool. Yeah, and with Thor and Plumeria here, again, it should be straightforward to, like, get them into position for the next turn and have, like, since Sather does have Smite, uh, we can, like, move Sather. Yeah, okay. I I'm pretty sure I can improv turn two. So, yeah, let's, let's do that. Okay, so let's just say uh, we're on turn three, and we have Thor here, uh, Plumeria here, right? We got everyone out of position. Um, I guess Reagan could still be here. Uh, Sather has smite, so Sather hopefully should be in position here. Um, Marianne, yeah, let's make Marianne go here. And then Edelgard, let's say here. I mean, Edelgard's position doesn't really matter as long as she's out of guard range. But ideally, we probably want to get into this position so that both Edelgard can transform and avoid guard, and then Sather can smite Thor up. And because Sather is the only one with smite besides Thor, Plumeria will, I guess, need to get repoed up, probably. Yeah. And as a reminder, last turn, uh, this obstruction is clear. So we, this catapult isn't in the way. So let's say uh, Sather smites Thor up. So Thor will go here. So that's one action down. Sather can no longer act. So Thor goes here. And then it doesn't really matter because uh, Idun is near safe. Although there is steady stance. Hmm. Okay, so that means that we don't actually get to proc Gale Force on Thor. That is a problem. But with the Bolt Tower, we should still be able to take out Idun, I think, right? Um, yeah. Doing quick math. Yeah, we, we only need to do 8 damage. There's no way we don't get that. So yeah, let's, uh, let's say, uh, Idun is out. So, goodbye, Idun. Um, so yeah. We don't proc Gale Force, so we need to get Plumeria into range. So Reagan will have to, uh, like, repo up Plumeria, right? And so Reagan will go here, do that, and then, I don't know, go back, I guess. <laughs> yeah, Reagan, uh, I guess Reagan doesn't really do much. So yeah, Plumeria then goes here and dance, right? So Thor now has another action. And then I... And then because uh, Hector is a far save unit, and we do have Marianne, um, we probably want to like take out Brave Hector so that Marianne can go in and proc. Now, before I do that, who do we want to trap? That we probably should have thought of that earlier. Um, hmm. I mean, the easy ones are either Krom or Arvel. We want to trap either Krom or Arvel. I mean, that, that just makes the most sense. Theoretically, we can trap uh, both Mirabilis, Arvel, and Volk, but that's a bit complicated and requires three units to do, so let's just assume we can only trap Krom and Arvel. If Thor attacks here and we get rid of Hector, Thor, with the two combats, should be in Wom range, so we can start warping in. We can warp in Marianne here. We can also warp in Edelgard. And that's really it. That's all the units we have left. Okay. So we do have a pattern, the like the multiple follow-ups pattern of follow-up. So Edel because Marianne um, warping to here will block out that one point of engagement. We only have one point of engagement. So it has to be Edelgard going, being the one that goes in and attacks Volk. Okay. Uh, how much? How much defense does Volk have? Um, total bulk is seventy nine. I guess uh, seventy nine, eighty four, 
Nothing else. Yeah, only 79. Um, I think, I think Edelgard is able to meet that. Because we have, like, so much attack. So yeah, uh, doing quick math, I, I have Edelgard stats uh, besides me. But I believe we do are able to take out Volk, even though he's not affected by the Volk Tower. We definitely do make this attack check, though. There's nothing granting him extra attack besides... Actually, no, yeah, 56 should be all he gets. Yeah, so we should be able to meet that attack check. So yeah, let's move Edelgard. Uh, let's have Edelgard warp in here and take out, take out Volk. Um, we should be able to get Gale Force down to two, so we can move up here. Whoops. We should be able to move up here and then take out Katria, which should also be able to proc Gale Force, and that will leave the space. That, that will leave this space open for Marianne to then warp in and, I guess, take out Mirabilis. Okay, first of all, do we meet this attack check? Oh, wow. Fortress defense. Uh, yeah, we should be able to meet that attack check. Yeah. Uh, do we uh, take out Katria? This is um, 88. Yeah, 88 bulk. Okay, I think we do. Yeah, quick math, say we do. Okay, so let's just assume then. Edelgard will be able to proc Gale Force, so Edelgard is still active. Okay, but how do we trap Arvel? I don't think we can do that. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on. I, I just thought of something. If we can... Uh, Warp and Marianne. Edelgard is still active. So the only units that have ended turn is Thor and Plumeria. So if we Warp and Marianne, say here, take out, uh, take out Mirabilis with Requiem Dance, we should be able to dance up Plumeria again. And because Plumeria has acrobatics, um, once Plumeria gets danced, we can have Edelgard go here now. Take out Arvel, and then have Plumeria warp in over here. Dance Edelgard, and then, and then have Edelgard, I guess, go down here and get Marianne out of the way, and that will leave Krom trapped. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, we're getting somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um. That should work, assuming I calc everything correctly. Okay, let me double check this. Um, Sather smites Thor up. Uh, Thor engages here. Yeah, we. I sort of uh, made this really messy, but hopefully when you do this, this is a lot cleaner. <laughs> or like when you write it down. Um, Reagan. Reagan can repo up Plumeria and I guess get out of the way. Plumeria goes here, dances Thor to take out Brave Hector. And then Edelgard can move in, take out um, Bulk, Katria. Marianne could get warp in, take out take out Mirabilis. Dance, that dances up Plumeria. So Edelgard goes in, takes out Arvel, and then Plumeria warps in with Acrobatics, dances up Edelgard, and Edelgard can repo Marianne out of the way. Yeah. Okay, I think that is the plan. All right, cool. Now it's time to execute it. All right. So let's see. Uh, we need Edelgard here, and we need Marianne here, according to the diagram. Everyone is else is in the correct positions. All right, cool. So let's begin the first turn. We did plan out the first turn. Um, we need Marianne to take out this obstruction so that Sather can take out this catapult to open up space for Thor to engage without, without having to worry about traps. Um, thankfully, we have Reagan here Over as here? predicted so that we can repo Sather out and Kanto over. Even if Kanto Control did activate, we could have still just moved here. So that's good. Um, let's Close have Sather... 
over here so we can take out this obstruction so that we can have Thor in place as as we planned. And yeah, we need to move Edelgard here so that on the next turn she can move one more over to avoid guard from Arvel. So yeah, that was the first turn as we have planned. Uh, didn't really plan out the second turn, but it should be straightforward. We just need Thor and Plumeria in position to be either smited or repoed up. Um, let's move our smite bot over here so that we have room for Marion to go over here so that we can have Edelgard out of the way of Arbol. And yeah, we should be good to go for the third turn. Everyone is where they need to be for the third turn for our little diagram. And yeah, so let us... Uh, Let's see here. It says we need to smite Without Thor, so let's do that. And then we'll have Thor they engage. Doesn't really matter since save. But we did see that Idun does have Sturdy Stance, so we we're probably not By going to get uh, Gale Force down to two cooldown, which is unfortunate. Regardless, we would still need to dance anyways. So let's repo Plumeria up as planned. Um. Dance Thor. And yeah, we need to take out Brave Hector so that we can have Marianne take out Mirabilis. So let's go ahead and do that. And yeah, let's check. Uh, we do take out Mirabilis and we have plus 13 speed. That makes that 55 to... Oh, okay. Yeah, we definitely meet the speed check and there is no guard. So that's good. But before we do that, um, we will need to yes. warp in Edelgard. We do take out Volk, plus 12, minus 6. We do meet this attack check, so that's good. We'll get a Heavy Blade to get Gale Force down to 2. And yeah, we're going to do what? our uh, double follow-up pattern. First warp in Edelgard, take out Volk, and then take oh, out Kajia. Oh, whoa. Exactly, though. Okay. Um, that was a lot closer than I thought it would be, but... Thankfully, our quick maths uh, were correct. <laughs> Let's see, 61 yes. versus 70, plus 12. Okay, yeah, we do meet this attack check here. Plus 12 attack makes this 82 versus uh, oh, nothing, way. so 61. We obviously meet that attack check, what? so that's good. Let's take out Katria. Um, and yeah, as we planned before we uh, take our yes. final turn with Edelgard, we should warp in and take out Mirabilis. This will dance out Plumeria, because again, Plumeria has the highest HP of the units in range that have ended turn. So that should be so. We correctly dance Plumeria, who despite yes, having yes. gravity, does have acrobatics and wings of mercy, so it doesn't really matter that she has gravity. So let's have Edelgard finish off Arvel. And with the acrobatics, as we predicted, uh, we'll go ahead and dance Edelgard. And then use Edelgard yes. to reposition Marianne out of the way. And yeah, that is a successful Gale Force clear. Very nice. And yeah, uh, we didn't plan the finish up, but again, with Chrom Trap, this is pretty straightforward. We have a lot of turns, so we can take as much time as we need. Um, oh wow, we actually need that. Okay, we probably could have uh, finished this a lot sooner, but again, no need to uh, no need to make things too complicated. Let's finish this off. Over here. Take this uh, pot, and yeah. Okay, we don't finish that now. Um, we'll just have Marianne take Chrom out then. Perfect. And yeah, we executed our strategy as diagrammed. So yeah, it was. It was pretty straightforward once we had the plan in place. Obviously, there were some really close calls, but um, with our powerful quick maths, we were able to do it. So you can see how this can help those that are new to visualize and plan out the execution in advance and eventually get the hang of doing these clears. Eventually, as you get more experience, you'll need to do this less and less, and eventually not at all. But doing this allows you to make sure that all the units are where they need to be and can do the things you need them to do for Gale Force. To finish off the section on execution, 
I want to go over some things you should look out for that might try and hinder your clear. The first is Guard, which obviously can be a huge annoyance for Gale Force. Guard doesn't make Gale Force impossible though, as the most common method I've used to deal with Guard is to just leave those units with Guard to those that don't need to proc Gale Force anymore, whether that be ranged units like Ninjorn or Linja, especially if they're a near saver. For individual enemy units with Guard, see if you can make it so that you only deal with them on the final action of your initiator or follow-up units if they rely on Gale Force. Obviously, the last hit doesn't need to proc Gale Force anymore, so in general, you would try to save those units with Guard for last. On the same vein, when planning and executing your Gale Force clear, make sure you reach the required stat thresholds to activate Heavy Blade, Flashing Blade, or any other desired effect, and make sure you are able to take out the enemy. Meeting attack checks or speed checks are very critical to ensure you are able to proc those extra actions, so do make sure you are cognizant of that. If your initial planning, you find out that you don't actually meet those checks, then try to re-strategize or reorder your units or whatnot to work around that. Now the next hindrance is Warp Bubble or Gatekeeper, though that shouldn't be too much of an issue as long as you are able to take them out with the initiator, so when planning, try to make it so. If you are not running safety fence, then it is important to be careful of turn 1 teams like Dance Trap, making sure that you are either turn 1-ing that team or getting out of the way while still being in a position to be able to do your initiation is key here. And last but certainly not least, if you are relying on a dual or harmonic dance, or just dual units in general, be sure to try and take out the dual and harmonic units as soon as possible, or at least work around that. There are instances where it might not be possible to take out all of the dual or harmonic units, especially if the unit that you want to trap are the dual or harmonic unit, but in general, that is something that you need to look out for when doing those clears. This is why 2 for 1 dancers that don't rely on dual har harmonic skills like Brave Marianne are so good and flexible. So yeah, hopefully this has been helpful to you in getting started with Gale Force strategies. Like I mentioned before, this wasn't aimed to be a step-by-step -step instruction manual or anything. Rather, hopefully it showed how to think about Gale Force and how it works, and to give a high-level overview of the common patterns that we employ in Gale Force strategies. If you want to see more Gale Force in action, you can look at the AR videos I've done, which are basically all Gale Force clears. And if you have any questions, feel free to comment them. Uh, but yeah, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, hit the bell, all that jazz. It only takes five seconds to subscribe, but it truly does mean a lot. And I really do appreciate all the constant support. And yeah, enjoy Gale Force. It is definitely intimidating, and it might not work out the first time or the 10th, but as long as you keep at it and keep learning, you'll get it down to a breeze. And it is super fun and super satisfying. Thank you all so much and see you all next time. Bye everyone.